morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Connie. And I'm Danny. And we invite you to come and shelter with us in this season of gratitude and response to the great news that Christ has been raised. Let us worship God. Come on in. Our first lesson comes from Paul's second uh, letter to the church at Corinth. Hear the word of the Lord. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now for the second reading this morning is found from Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. Uh, this is the passage I'll be preaching from this morning. This is a psalm written by David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, the Philistine king, so that he drove him out and he went away. Hear the word of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes, makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer in want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for your presence with us. Uh, this is your day. Uh, you have us here for your purposes. We ask you to do a work in our life, Father. Uh, thank you for this time to worship you on this Sunday morning. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. It is great to be here with you at First Presbyterian Church, this wonderful church, a beautiful church, and to be with you this morning. I'm preaching this morning out of Psalm 34, but I want to talk to you this morning as we go through this quarantine time. Uh, the passage, uh, the sermon title is Every Crutch Removed, Removing the Crutches of Your Life. And if your time has been like mine and who I've talked with uh, the last uh, two months, this quarantine time somehow, some way exposes a lot of the crutches of our life and, and has, this time has been used to remove some of those crutches. Uh, sometimes crutches are the idols that have been exposed through this time. Uh, and there's a mounting pressure that I sense uh, from articles I read, from some of it comedy, uh, some of it serious, uh, a mounting pressure 
Uh, and you can know when a crutch is really a crutch or an idol because when, it, it, when it's being removed, it feels like someone standing on an air hose of oxygen to your life. And we fight that. We don't like our crutches to be removed. And it's time like this, in a quarantine time, when we're having to socially and physically distance from one another, uh, having to abide by certain rules, uh, we're not doing things normally, everything can sometimes seem like it's backfiring. Uh, maybe before in your life, uh, before this time, if you're as old as I am, you have had times in your life when everything is backfiring. We realize in times like this, uh, how little control we have over life. And it's interesting to me to watch the TV ads, the shows, the print media, uh, the advertisements, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Columbus Ledger, uh, articles on how to cope, how to get through these times, how to survive, how to thrive during these times. And perhaps you've seen crutches, in your life. I want you to think about that this morning. Things you have always leaned on, but somehow evaporate into thin air. Uh, sometimes during times like this, you may have felt and seen your life unraveling like a cheap sweater. Things you have invested your life in, invested your time in, that you have leaned hard on uh, that is no longer there or it is evaporating from you. So this morning, I want us to direct us uh, uh, to a Bible passage uh, that is the source of truth for us. Um, the Bible, when I was in seminary, one of my professors said, the Bible is always a return to reality. And I know today, we need a return to reality. We need a foundation. We need a crutch that will not break. And this passage this morning and the one out of 2 Corinthians are ones that we can lean on hard this morning. And that's good news for us today as we make this long run marathon uh, through this quarantine time. And I asked the question too this morning, uh, as God is sovereign, if uh, I'd heard the question asked uh, of myself, I may not be quoting it exactly, but if God, if we knew what God knew all the time, uh, then we would be perfectly satisfied. Uh, but we're human and we're finite and we don't always understand what God is doing. Uh, so I, we come to Psalm 34 written by David at a most difficult, one of the lowest times of his life. Uh, David had great highs in his life, just like you have had great highs in your life. He had defeated God, Goliath, uh, he was anointed by Samuel the prophet, uh, a spiritual leader, as a successor to King Saul. He was heir to the throne, uh, yet he was not there yet. Uh, he's in a 15-year period waiting to become the next king of Israel. He's in the not there yet time period of his life, just like sometimes we are. And he's in this period where all of his crutches, uh, five major ones, are removed from his life. Uh, if you're taking notes, I've got five crutches that I want us to think about, and perhaps you can relate to some of these crutches. Um, this, most of this takes place in 1 Samuel that records David's life during this difficult time. And as he was waiting to be king, uh, he was doing everything he could to please Saul, but Saul would not have anything to do with it. Saul was uh, paranoid and intimidated by David. Saul knew his time was coming to an end, uh, and he tried to make things as difficult for David as he could. David had defeated Goliath. He had the love of the people at one time, but uh, things were not going well for David. And the, the first crutch removed from his life was the crutch of a good position. David was in the army of Israel. He had proven himself faithful. He was even heroic. Uh, and it's all gone now. He's out of the army. He's on the run. 
He will never again serve in Saul's army uh, as a soldier. And so he sees this time of his life. He loved that time in the army. Uh, it brought a lot of things to him. Uh, it was a great crutch for him to uphold him, give him great self-worth. And he sees that crutch come to an end. Secondly, God removes the crutch of David's wife. In 1 Samuel 18, verses 20 to 21, uh, after he slew Goliath. Saul says that I'll give my daughter, Michael, to him as David's wife. And so when he learned it was David, and David did all these things, he says, I'm going to give him Michael so that she might become a snare to him. He even used his own daughter for deceitful ways to bring David down. Saul was deceitful in that way because he's paranoid. He's trying to kill David. Uh, but David finds himself a fugitive on the run. Uh, that's a tough way of living. Um, if you've ever lived that way and lived on the run from something. Uh, but Michael, she truly does love David and wants the best for him. She knows her father, his time is coming to an end. And almost like you can say, what goes around comes around. Michael protects David and she helps him to escape, and she deliberately walks away from him to save him during this time. So he loses uh, his wife during this time period and isn't able to have that intimate relationship uh, of support that we usually get from our spouses. Thirdly, he's lost two crutches. Thirdly, he loses, he loses Samuel as a crutch to lean on. Samuel had been his spiritual leader, had been the one that picked him out amongst his brothers. He was the youngest one, and God said, select that one, and he did, and he anointed David with oil and said, you're going to be the next king of Israel. And so Samuel mentored David. Uh, Samuel uh, was a secure place for David to lean on. And so right now, David's in a place, he's lost his position, He's lost his wife, and he's lost his mentor, a solid place for him to lean on. So Samuel dies during this time, and David gradually is losing all of his support mechanisms. Everything he might have leaned on is getting knocked out from under him. Even his emotional stability is slowly eroding. Uh, if you read the passages in 1 Samuel once calm, once confident warrior that David was, he is starting to feel the squeeze of life as his crutches are knocked out from under him. And we see this best in his encounter with his closest friend, Jonathan, who happened to be the son of Saul. But Jonathan loved David. He had committed himself to David. He, he didn't have a problem with David becoming the king even though Saul wanted Jonathan to be the king. Uh, he cries out to Jonathan when they met together because they were such close friends. He says, why is your father trying to kill me? He was desperate to know that. What have I done wrong? Why? Death was dogging David every step of his life. And I asked the question, have you ever been like that? Have you ever felt death dogging you along the path of life? I've spoken with many of our war veterans that we're blessed to have here in Columbus, Georgia, and I've heard some of them describe that horrible feeling, uh, knowing death hanging in the air, not sure if you're ever going to make it past this day. Uh, what a tough way to live. In 1 Samuel 20 and 21, if you ever have a chance to read this, and I would encourage you to, describes the last visit of David and Jonathan. It's a beautiful picture of a great, a great relationship that they had. Uh, what a moment for David. Uh, God has taken away his position. God has taken away his wife. God has taken away Samuel, his spiritual leader and mentor. And now David loses his closest friend, Jonathan. Jonathan, it's tough losing your closest relationships. 
I would imagine most of us has been in those situations where we do leave, lose those who are so dear to us and we don't know where we're going to turn to in the future to lean on. Uh, David is in a tough situation. But then there's a final blow that occurs to him, a fifth crutch that is removed from him. And ultimately, that is that David loses his own self-respect. That's the last crutch. In fact, it's the lowest tide of a person's life to lose your own self-respect. In 1 Samuel 21, David finds himself in such despairing situations that he flees to the enemy capital, the Philistine capital of Gath. Gath is the Washington, D.C. of Goliath's hometown. He has killed Goliath, and he finds himself in such a bad situation that he thinks, I might find more protection, more friendship in Gath. Maybe I need to change real estate, move to someplace else to try to gather myself together. And so he goes to Gath, to the capital of the Philistine Empire. And yes, David is quite conspicuous, without a doubt. He has killed their champion. And you can imagine when he rides into town, they all grab their weapons like, what is he going to do? He walks deliberately into the enemy headquarters. And in 1 Samuel 21, it tells us that he is recognized. David is scared. David is frightened. And David is panicked. Let me read to you the verses from 1 Samuel 21, uh, 12 through 15 that describe as he is recognized and he is brought before the Philistine king Abimelech. Uh, which is a precursor of Psalm 34. And David is so fearful in verse 12 of 1 Samuel 21. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought his fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Uh, what a put down for David uh, as he sees this king of the Philistine empire. He's even faking it so bad that he needs a drool cup. He's foaming at the mouth, acting like a bad man. You see, David has hit rock bottom at this point. And I tell you, when every one of your crutches are removed, uh, that feels like rock bottom. It is rock bottom. Things begin to erode. And in erosion of our crutches, we think differently. We begin to lose sight of the truth. Uh, you hit rock bottom just like David did. That is a dark place. It is not a fun place to be. Um, but it's funny in the Bible that the Philistine king, Achish, he says, I don't need another crazy soldier. He didn't seek to kill him. He said, get rid of him. Uh, and David finds himself falling into the Philistine camp. But even the enemy camp, David couldn't find relief. Uh, it's a desperate time in his life. And so for the problem for David, uh, for you, and for me, uh, is when we trust in crutches, uh, there are three things to know about crutches uh, before I uh, finish. Crutches, first of all, crutches, I've got three points I want to make about crutches, is that they become a substitute for God. It's tough when God knocks the slats out of our life. When you see life and you realize you have built it like a house of cards. If you've ever done that at home before, perhaps you've done that during this quarantine time, and it takes just one touch and it all falls apart. That is a very low point when you realize your crutch can fall like a house of cards. Secondly, crutches keep you focused on the horizontal, which you can just see looking from side to side. 
Leaning on others or other things is a sideways focus. It's not vertical up to the Lord. You find yourself leaning constantly on another person or some other thing or material possession, which means ultimately you're not leaning on God. And thirdly, crutches I have found only offer temporary relief. Um, we turn to some remedy to soothe us and dull the pain. We want to be tranquilized in some way or some kind of experience in order to endure life storms. And right now, it's tough now. There are no sports. Uh, there are no restaurants on TV. There are no TV much or reruns all the time. It's a difficult time for a lot of people. And you may be going this yourself, uh, not being able to communicate with others the way you're used to. And I'm here to tell us and remind us, as Psalm 34 does, as David speaks across the years to us, as the Holy Spirit speaks to us, that God doesn't give us temporary relief. He offers permanent solutions for us. David discovers this, and he writes Psalm 34 in response to this. That's his discovery of this. And some of you are in the process right now of having every crutch removed from your life. And it creates an enormous pain in your life. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's a lack of stability when it's torn from us, these crutches. It might be a broken romance or marriage. It might be broken trust. It might be the loss of your job or the loss of your status that you once had. It could be the loss of health, uh, of how precious it is. We learn that when we lose it. It might be the crutch of a loss of a dream, which you realized was just a fading fantasy. Uh, there's nothing more painful than being stripped of the toys of our heart. And God is using this time to call us to himself. Psalm 34 is a great reminder of that and a great call of God to this. I, I love this passage which David writes. He says, those who look to him have radiance, just like these new smart HD TVs that have brilliant pictures on them. Uh, perhaps your TV is like that. I don't even like looking at regular old TVs anymore. If it's not HD, I don't want to watch it. It frustrates me. Uh, but David talks about that. We are radiant. God gives us that when we uh, see that. He says we're never being ashamed. We're not ruled by our past. Doesn't have to define us. God gives us new things. And I believe God's doing a new thing through this time of quarantine. New things are necessary. Uh, verse 8 one of my favorite, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. David understood that. He took refuge in the Lord. God restored him. Uh, he tasted and he saw that the Lord was good, that new things are coming. Old things have passed away. I've chosen 2 Corinthians 5, one of my favorite New Testament passages that has spoken to me from the day I became a Christian. And he says, I love this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is good news for us. Uh, the old has passed away. The new has come. Uh, there's a newness in the air. And by turning to Christ, we become new. We have a new vision. We have a new foundation. We have a new family. We have a new status that is so refreshing, much more refreshing than anything the world can provide for us. And there's nothing wrong with leaning if you're leaning ultimately on the Lord Jesus Christ. As a human, you have to lean. We're made to be leaners. You can't walk the life of faith alone. That's why we have Christ. So we are built to be leaners. And no one can occupy that God-shaped vacuum but Christ alone. 
All the amusements, all the food, the things of this world cannot fulfill it. Only a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Being stripped of all the substitutes is the most painful thing on earth. Uh, I know that feeling personally. Uh, there's nothing more painful than being stripped of the toys of your heart, says Chuck Swindoll. Uh, so beware of our hearts. Our hearts are idol-making factories. Uh, we need to turn to Christ today, uh, take refuge in Him, uh, enshrine the Lord in your hearts this morning, lean only on Him. David needed to learn that, and maybe you do too this morning. It's, it was difficult for David, as you can see, uh, and you can expect the same as well. I want to finish this morning with a prayer by one of my favorite theologians and prayer warriors, uh, A.W. Tozier. Uh, and I want to ask you to pray along with me and encourage you to turn to Christ for your refuge, to taste and see the Lord this morning. Let us pray. Father, I want to know Thee, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding, and I do not try to hide from Thee the terror of parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a very part of my living self, so that thou mayest enter and dwell there without rival. Then shalt thou make the place of thy feet glorious. Then shall my heart have no need of the sun to shine in it, for thyself will be the light of it, and there shall be no night there. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.